Good morning. Just to extend a special thanks to Isabel, she gave a uh, organized, did a lot of work to make sure the speakers were all very well taken care of. I extend a, a great thank you to her and Simon and Jan, so please give another round of applause to them. One of the benefits of being a keynote actually was a personal guided bike tour of Berlin yesterday, which uh, as an American, I enjoyed very much the exercise. <laughs> So what am I here today to talk about? Uh, you know, you're all here because of search and scalability and storage and things like that. And so I got to thinking, well, it's a buzzwords conference, so let's talk about buzzwords. And three of my favorite buzzwords as an open source person, somebody who likes to work on big problems, is uh, open and scalable. And then I would like to make a case to you why I think it matters that we should also think about intelligence in our applications. So what I'm going to talk about today is take a look at what some of these words mean, some of the associations that go along with them, and then because we're all technical, let's get in and talk a little bit about how we can add intelligence to our applications as well. So audience participation is encouraged. What comes to mind when you see the word open? Open source. Open source. I think I've got that on there. Yep. Open source. Any others? What's that? Standards, very good. Standards, any others? You guys awake yet? Hardware. hardware, open hardware, okay. Are you an open hardware hacker? No. is, I know, all right. Any others? Yeah. Open data, open data. Uh, open for business, we all uh, at the end of the day need to get paid for, uh, to make a living, so I think everybody here is also interested in, in uh, things being open for business. What about an open mind? Anybody have an open mind? I think one of the things that you're seeing with the NoSQL movement really is people are starting to think about new ways of solving problems that maybe they aren't used to in the past, right? Uh, personally speaking, I started out my career doing databases. I think, you know, how many people started their career? You, you've got your database and you're doing, you know, you're doing transactions and all of that stuff, right? How many people are doing that now? So yeah, so you're still using databases and all that, but one of the interesting things I found is I started on Lucene in 2004, and you know, we have all this NoSQL movement. Well, if you've been doing search, you've been doing NoSQL for a long time. You just didn't have a really cool name to go with it. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways, when I came into Lucene and, and, and thinking about search problems, it really opened my mind, and, and it uh, kind of allowed me to solve problems in ways that I hadn't normally solved problems, and it allowed me to take things to the next level, if you will, things that I wasn't used to doing. It pushed me as a programmer, pushed me as an engineer, and made me think about what is the bigger picture. What are the, instead of just being focused on, I have this particular hammer that allows me to solve this problem, I can think about, well, maybe I need a screwdriver to solve this problem. And so, you know, databases are still great. They solve a certain set of problems, and that's all really nice. But other times, you don't need all of that, and you, could, you can get away with some other things. Another thing that comes to my mind anyways with open is free. We all like uh, free software and free beer and all of those good things. So free is another good one. Uh, then, you know, maybe there's some negative associations with open. For instance, things can be open-ended. I think oftentimes what we see, especially as you get into bigger problems, is things kind of drag out. They can, they can go on and on. Like you're not sure when things are, when are you done? You know, you've got all these users, you've got all this data. What am I going to do with all that? When am I finished? When should I release this thing? Uh, when, when, can I, when can I just kind of say, okay, this is good enough? And so, you know, maybe we can work some of that in there. Uh, you can also be too open, right? Uh, you know, Facebook, I think, is facing a lot of these troubles right now. This, all these problems around privacy. Are we too open? Do, are people compromising their uh, values and priorities just solely in terms of uh, making a buck or in, in uh, being on the latest and greatest technology. So again, you can, you know, you can think about it. As, a, as I'm building an application, am I making this too open? What, what concerns should I have on that end? Kind of the last thing that I thought of that comes to mind is this notion of open is also unstructured. And I think uh, what we're seeing a lot of the times these days is things are unstructured. We're no longer just dealing with rows and columns and numbers. We also have a lot of text. We have a lot of signals from uh, various devices and things like that. 
And if you start to think about things in an unstructured way, that can also open your mind as well. And in fact, if, uh, if we think a little bit more about unstructured, in fact, some people actually estimate that over 80% of the data we produce is unstructured. A lot of that is text. A lot of it, of course, is things like video and audio and all of that stuff. Uh, Twitter, of course, has added uh, enormous volumes to, to the notion of unstructured text. And I would posit that, in fact, that how you deal with unstructured text and unstructured data it can often be one of the things that makes or breaks your organization. How well you deal with that, how well you learn from it, all of those things go into how successful you can be. And then last but not least on the unstructured notion is, is there really such a thing as unstructured data? If you really even look at text, of course there's structure in it. The thing is, is we just don't necessarily know how to make use of it. So as we're getting better with all of those things, I think that you're seeing more and more things have, we can put structures onto them automatically, we can tag things, we can annotate them, and we'll talk about some of the ways to do that here in a few minutes. So a lot of the reason why you guys are here, a lot of great open source tools out there. Of course, this is just a small sampling. These are kind of projects I'm familiar with and, and work with from time to time. Of course, there's CouchDB and, and, and MongoDB and all these other ones out there. These are kind of the ones I deal with. But, you know, there's a lot of open opportunities here. There's a lot of things that, you know, five years ago you had to build yourself or ten years ago you had to build yourself. I think the reason why all of us are here is the fact that there's all these great tools out here and we don't have to build those things anymore. We can build things at the layer above. And, and I, what I want to talk about a lot today is that layer above of what we can then build on top of these things. So let's start thinking, what about scalable? What comes to mind when you hear scalable? Anyone? All right. What's that? Fail the fail whale? Well, when Twitter is down. Ah, when Twitter's down, okay. So it's not scalable. <laughs> of course, algorithms. Everybody knows MapReduce, and they know how to implement MapReduce and things like that. That's where, or we're here to learn about those things. We want to be, uh, we want to have algorithms that scale. You want to be able to take in as much data as possible. Big data, that often comes to mind. We need lots of storage, that all comes to mind around the word scale scalable. Of course, as soon as you get to anything of size, you need to be distributed. So now all of a sudden you're talking, your networks need to be scalable, you need to have fast networks, fast data centers, links between data centers, all of those different things. You need to be fault tolerant, to Jan's point here. Uh, when, when the thing's down, you're losing money, so we've got to think about fault tolerance as part of all of that. We also, I would say, need to think about commodity. You're running on commodity hardware these days, most people are. They, they need to have uh, tools that are cheap. They need to have hardware that's cheap, memory that's cheap, all of those things, because in order to scale, you really need to be able to, be, to minimize the cost of those things. We'll talk more about commodities in a, in a minute. Another thing, actually, I think is, is useful to think about is this notion of scale-free which is the idea that the algorithms and things that you run should be able to run no matter how many machines you need. If you're running on one machine, it should work just as well as if it's running on a thousand machines. Are we there yet? Are, is it always possible? Of course not, but it's certainly something to think about because as you know, some problems, or as you grow, you just you want to make sure that you don't have to rewrite this thing every you know every two x in growth that you're facing. So scale free can be important as well. Last, not, but la last but not least, I think uh, it's important to think about a scalable workforce. I mean, why are you guys here, right? You want to learn how to scale and search and, and deal with big data and big problems, right? So as a workforce, we really need to be able to take those things on as well. And, and, and I, would, I would suggest that one of the nice things about all of this stuff being open is that at, that, that then allows a workforce to scale. You know, it's no longer the case that you have to go to a company like Google where you want to work on big data and, and then have, uh, you know, and be trained in on just their specific technology, and Google's just an example, obviously, but any big company, right, you can be trained in on their technology. Well, how good is that, you know, if you want to then leave or you're going to go work somewhere else or you're going to go do your own startup, you need to be able to hire and get people who are scalable that they can take on and they can, uh, they can adjust. The, the, the people themselves are fault tolerant as well. They, they know how to adapt. They know how to deal with with all of these problems. They're trained in on new technologies and things like that. 
just to kind of put a little picture to the size of scalability, big data, right? Little slide, uh, you know, we've got the really small, the really small dot there. That's actually 2006. You guys were all alive in 2006, right? Were you guys, how many people were actually working on big data in 2006? A few. Now look at 2010. That's almost uh, 1,000 exabytes. I don't even, exabytes, you know, that's really, really large, right? That's just four years. Four years. Think about that. That's four, not five, right? Four years. We've gone from 160 exabytes to 1,000 exabytes. That's a lot more data that we have to deal with. And of course, if we then cycle back to the open side of this, We've gotten pretty good at dealing with a lot of this data. This is just, a, again, one example. Of course, I'm biased towards Lucene and Hadoop and all of these things, but there are certainly people who are dealing with all of these things in the real world. And so, for instance, we can take Solar and Lucene and, and Hadoop and all of those things, and we can build open scalable search. And that's all good. There's plenty of people running on really, really large systems with Lucene and Solar and Hadoop in the mix, uh, you know, a billion documents, 10 billion documents, uh, hundreds or thousands of queries per second, things like that. It makes for a really nice picture and a really nice story. But, you know, if we go back to here, you know, what's that going to be in four years again, right? I mean, it, it'll probably actually be even a, a bigger multiplier than, uh, than that one, right? So if we come back in four years, maybe somebody else will be putting up an even bigger slide there. And in fact, this is my one solar cloud slide. Uh, I think, the, and, and Lucene at a little deeper level here, I think the, the picture is getting even better. I mean, the nice thing about all of this data is it's all more accessible too. And, and what we're seeing is people are really starting to push the boundaries. And in fact, I think for in Lucene and solar land and, and all of those that you'll be quite happy to know that we're go growing and, and gaining with that as well. There's a number of nice things. That, uh, Simon and Uwe will be talking later about a lot of what's going on in Lucene. I think some of the, the, the really exciting things in Lucene, just to touch on them, is flexible indexing. This notion that you can have exact control over what's in the index, that's really exciting because you can now decide how much disk space you want to use, how much RAM. You can have almost near total control over all of those things. And that's really important, I think, as you scale, because you have to make then hard decisions about what do I really need in order for my application to be successful. If you're in solar land, uh, which many of you I'm sure are, uh, the solar cloud stuff, anybody been following that? So solar cloud is this notion of taking uh, Apache Zookeeper and integrating it with solar, but also just making, right now and in, in, in solar 1.4, you've been able to do distributed search for a while, and it's pretty well understood how to do distributed indexing with Lucene and solar. Uh, but what you often saw is that for most people, you know, once you got, say, past uh, 30 or 50 nodes with distributed search and solar, uh, the operations side of the equation became more intense and you had to deal with making sure uh, you know everything's up and, and you, your admin people had to deal a lot with that. Uh, you know that being said most people aren't in uh, you know in the hundreds of nodes with with solar anyways and, you know and the number of people who truly need that is not that big uh, but the idea here behind the solar cloud movement is let's just make it easy for people to do all of this without having to think about it. And you know, Zookeeper is a, is a great tool for that. I don't know if we actually have any Zookeeper talks uh, the next two days or not, but I would encourage you guys all to check out Zookeeper. And if you want to learn more about how Solar is using it, you can look at that uh, wiki link there. And then last but not least, on the other side, so the Solar Cloud stuff deals a lot with the management. Uh, we've got things like uh, software-based load balancer in there. We've got, you just need one configuration and it will automatically send it out to all your nodes. There will be things like rebalancing and, and rebalancing of your shards and all of that stuff. And you can just bring up new shards and they just automatically register with Zookeeper. All, all quite nice. Uh, that actually, I believe, is going to be committed into Lucene and Solar any day now, if it hasn't already. I'm, I'm not, you know, been out of touch a little bit, so I know Mark Miller has been working pretty heavily on it and should be in pretty soon. The last slide there, Solar Hadoop, uh, there's, there's a Solar Issue 1301, I believe it is. Basically, uh, if you want to talk to Andre here, he can fill you in more on it. Uh, he just raised his hand there. 
basically the idea of using Hadoop to do all of your indexing side and then bring those into solar, that's all quite nice and easy to do and I know a number of people are using that in production as well. So in other words, the whole, the whole scalability slide for uh, Lucina Solar is looking quite nice these days. I'd also, you know, many of you maybe are not in search. I'd say we've also gotten pretty good at, you know, dealing with Hadoop and, and then we go off and we write a bunch of MapReduce jobs or maybe we use uh, Hadoop Streaming or we use Dumbo or any one of those tools. And we've got pretty good at doing this kind of, you know, data crunching problem. We've got logs, we've got massive user logs and things like that that we, we want to do analytics on. And my mic keeps falling off here, so. Um, and I think there's several talks this week, uh, these next two days about this kind of side of the coin, business intelligence and things like that. We've also got good at doing this, the social graph. But you know, kind of the last thing I would say though is, are we intelligent about these things? Now, a lot of times we have some intelligence in there and we have, uh, we've written, we've done a lot of work on those things, but you know, maybe there's some better ways that we can do these things and that's what I'd like to talk about. So. What comes to mind with, with, about intelligence? You know, so first off, I think kind of the first layer, order of business is, you know, we need to be able to find our data, we need to be able to organize our data, we need to be able to discover, we need to allow our users to discover their data. And then we also want to be able to associate those things. We want to be able to associate our users with the proper, you know, with the data that is of interest to them. And we want to then make that all easier. Uh, and of course, we want to do this all at scale. Uh, the, the kind of the next level, I think, and, and you're seeing a lot of this now in terms of uh, companies that are social networking type sites, you know, basically the idea is that you're using the collective, you're using all of us to give more personalized capabilities. So the idea being, you know, we're all in the same area, the things that are of interest to you probably are of interest to me, but, you know, they're probably not interest to my wife who is not technical at all. So, you know, making sure that she's getting what she needs while I'm getting the kind of things that I need is, is an important part of this whole piece of intelligence, I would say. And a number of companies obviously are already doing this and making it all available. And you start to think about what, what are some of the other levels that are maybe higher up above these things. There's, there's a number of, uh, you see these almost starting up every day now, these uh, social awareness companies, the, these people who are doing uh, sentiment analysis, basically trying to figure out what are people saying about, you know, companies or people or those things, and they want to have this notion of, you know, you know, I love Apple, but I hate Windows, or I love Windows and I hate Apple, and, and those kind of things. And they want the idea being that we can take all of this information and then feed that back to, you know, if you're a, in the commercial space, I can feed that back to a company and then they can maybe do something about it so that you can engage with people at a much deeper level than just always being in this, in this publish mode that we've been in for so long. You know, you can actually see whether the things that you're doing are being effective uh, within your organization. So, you know, you see a lot of people talking about sentiment analysis. It's actually a very hard problem. They're also trying to get at what are the meaning, what are the meaning of things that people are doing and saying and, and things like that. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of effort in natural language processing. So that can factor into your capabilities. Of course, when it comes to intelligence, one, you know, one of the hallmarks of humans is, you know, as, as an intelligent being, we hopefully learn from our mistakes. And not only do we learn from our mistakes, but we use that then to plan for the future. You know, so if, uh, you know, as a kid, you, you put your hand on the stove and you burn your hand, you know that in the future that the stove is hot, I should not do that anymore. Can we get computers that, that can do that? Sometimes it's getting better. Uh, other things you want to do, right? You want to have knowledge. Can we just have all this knowledge in the computer and can we reason about it? Can we solve hard problems with it? Can we understand it? Can we, can we get all of those things together and then make our lives easier because the computer can do all of these things, right? So I think, you know, and obviously this is just the, the start of things. You know, these are some of the things that come to mind when I think about intelligence. Anybody have any other ones that they, they think about in terms of intelligence? No, you guys are, I already got you all asleep. That's good. So then the kind of the last bit of intelligence to tie this all back together is, can we do this in an open way? And can we do this in a scalable way? So then the question also becomes, well, why do I care? You guys are all looking at me. What's this guy talking about intelligence? Yeah, you know, we're all smart. We have intelligence. But why should I care? 
Well, I think uh, there's a number of reasons. First off, uh, there's essentially the world, you know, in terms of storage and data and CPUs, that's all being commoditized, right? All of those things are becoming cheaper. And in fact, as we grow in all of this, you know, as a workforce, that the more that becomes a commodity too, if you're not doing things that are intelligent, if you're not adding this extra layer that, that involves uh, some deeper thinking than just crunching through things as fast as possible, you're at risk of becoming a commodity too, which means your salary net maybe is not going to be going up as fast as, it sh as you would like. Maybe your application, your users are leaving for something else that's more intelligent. So I think it's very highly important that you recognize, uh, you know, where commoditization is happening and then think about how you can stay ahead of that curve. Because in fact, uh, thanks to technologies like Lucene and a number of other great ones out there and Hadoop and all of that, these things are all becoming commodities too, right? So, you know, 15 years ago, what did you have to do to have a search engine? Right? You had to go build your own. You probably had to have a PhD on staff who knew how to do term frequencies and inverse document frequencies and vector math and, and, and all of that stuff that goes in. You can go to Apache right now and you can download all of that. You don't even have to think about that underneath the hood. That's a commodity, right? Because it's just there. You take it for granted that that exists. So now all of a sudden, you're thinking about the layers on top, okay? And that's why you need to be more intelligent because in fact, some of those layers on top, the things that you just did for a while, I mean, for a while now, right, you've just had to take that search, you, you plug it in, you throw some highlighting on there, you show your 10 results, voila, you got, you've got web search, you've got your basic Google search box, right? That's all commodity as well, I would argue. You can do that. You know, I've seen, I've, I've been in customers where we've had near production ready capabilities in less than five days on serious amounts of data. Now, granted, they got to go through their whole QA cycles and load testing and all that stuff, but we were able to model their domain, get their stuff out of their database into solar or into a search system and up and running where they could meet, you know, 80, 90% of their requirements just right out of the box. Think about how powerful that is. And then on the same side, you know, distributed computing paradigms, Hadoop, Zookeeper, all of these things. I, you know, I actually started my career doing parallel and distributed uh, simulations, radar simulations, and I was running on things like the, the CM5 and, and uh, so the Thinking Machines CM5 and some of these really big iron machines. They cost like uh, $10 million and, and I think they don't do, you know, 10 or $20 million and they don't even do hardly what we did today. But, you know, you can then now take, and, and we were doing all kinds of message passing and all that stuff, and a lot of times you had to actually write your own libraries to do all that stuff. That's all free now. You don't even have to think about it, and it just works for the most part, for the most part. Um, so I would argue then that what, what you're seeing, and this is happening very rapidly, that is both open source and scalability demands are pushing more and more commoditization, right? And so then you have to ask yourself, uh, well, what can I do to stay ahead? And I would say, you know, and I would argue intelligence is the key here. And in fact, we all know and we all deal with people uh, every day, right? Intelligence is in short supply. You go out driving on any street in any major city and, and you know what I'm talking about. People, people are just care about themselves. There's no, there's no thought about the bigger picture or any of those things. So intelligence really becomes very important, I think, for us to really take things to the ne next level. And I think one of the ways, one of the ways that that can help is machine learning. And that then, of course, brings me into where I think uh, you can go right now and start to build things that are intelligence. And so that's why I kind of want to talk a little bit about, about Mahout and then also some of how some of these other tools all fit in so that we can build open, scalable, intelligent applications. And then, you know, I, I put Mahout out here, but there are actually a lot of great projects out there. One of the things that I think distinguishes Mahout is the fact that we really are focused on scalability from the get-go. We've, uh, you know, we're, we're running on, Mahout mostly is based on, if you're not familiar with Mahout, it's based on Hadoop for the most part. We do a lot of these machine learning algorithms by utilizing Hadoop to take care of all of that capabilities. Uh, that being said, not all machine learning problems need that kind of scale, and there's some great tools out there like Weka and OpenNLP and Gate and uh, Stanford has a nice library, and there's a bunch from other places. And uh, so you can start to think then about 
well, what do I really need for my application? And you know, then you can start to piece all of these together. And the idea here is that really you're spending less time worrying about all that infrastructure stuff and you can be at that higher level. And the higher level is where you're going to make the difference in your application and in your, for your users and your companies. So what can you do right now to add intelligence? What I kind of want to get at is things that don't require you to write all the underlying things. You know, there, there are tools and libraries available that do this right now. Uh, obviously, they're biased towards the things I deal with, so they're going to be Lucene and Solar and Mahout and Hadoop and things like that. But, you know, if you want to talk about other ways, you know, there's a number of people here who are doing other things as well, and I would encourage you to talk to them. So what, do we, what can we kind of do? Let's, let's dig in here a little bit. We're all technical. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, first off, you know, like I said, this is the tip of the iceberg. There really is, it's, it's one of those fields you could spend your whole life in and, and never understand, uh, you know, more than 20% of actually what's going on. But I would say there's some easy wins out there right now that most people can do. For instance, you can start doing recommenders. Uh, I think we have two talks. I think they're both tomorrow on using how to build recommendation engines. So the idea here is, you know, people who bought this bought that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Organization. How many people really deal effectively with all the data that they get in on a daily basis? Right? I mean, you just, it's, it's just very hard, even at a personal level, to deal with the amount of email that you have and, and Twitter and Facebook and all of these things, right? So what tools can we use that maybe can help us organize these or build tools that help people organize their, their information? What tools can we use to help them discover things? How can we be more in touch with our users? How can we then use uh, location and spatial information as factors? And then how can we also make all these problems more manageable? I think you can do all of these things right now. Uh, so for getting started with recommendations, you've all probably seen recommendations. Sometimes it's called collaborative filtering if you've used Amazon, and that slide's a little bit fuzzy. But the idea here is I was looking for a book on, uh, I think I was looking at like a data mining book, and up came these other recommendations of people who bought this item also bought that item. So that's basically the idea of recommendations. Of course, it doesn't have to just be about books. You can recommend, you know, if you're a dating site, you can, you're recommending people to other people, all of those things. And in Mahout right now, you can do user-to-user -user based recommendations. You can do item-to-item -item based recommendations. The item-to-item -item based is really where it scales. And, you know, that, I would encourage you to look at that more. And in fact, Mahout has many different ways actually to model this program, uh, this, uh, these capabilities. So, uh, Sean, where's Sean? Sean and Frank, I don't know. So, Sean and Frank are both going to be talking tomorrow about this at a deeper level. One of the nice things here is we have MapReduce ready one. So, basically, you can take all of your, your massive, your, your really large matrix that you have all your recommendations in, and you can do that in a MapReduce way. And in fact, uh, Sean came up with a really nice uh, estimate there. If you're running on EC2, I believe with a large instance, or maybe it was an extra large, I'm not sure. But basically, the idea is that for, you can do about 1,000 recommendations for a penny, which is pretty cheap, right? And that's all, you know, that's all out of the box. I mean, obviously, you have to set up the ETC2 stuff and get your data into the right format. But actually doing the crunching and all of that is all right there and, and pretty cheap. So that's recommendations. Organization, so other words for this, classification, categorization, things like that. How can I take? all of my data and tag it and label it and, and classify it in maybe into predetermined uh, structures like a taxonomy or things like that. Right now in Mahout, there's uh, several different formats for doing this, both in terms of uh, what you, if you're familiar with like Bayesian statistics, there's uh, Bayesian, Bayesian models for that. There's also this notion of random forests. So you can just automatically, so for instance, if you had a site that took in all the world's news, and you had to prepare a briefing for the president, right? But you, you didn't have any way of, uh, you, you obviously can't just have people typing, oh, this one's about FIFA soccer, and that, that one's about, you know, some uh, trouble in, in Greece or something like that. You need to be, you want tools that can automatically do that for you. And so that's the kind of problems you can solve uh, with Mahout using classifiers and things like that. 
You can also do things like identify topics. So take a whole collection of documents and then go through and just tell me what are the key parts of this, uh, what are the key parts of the, these documents? What are the topics in this, these documents? And then from there you can decide, well, are those things that I want to further explore or not? And the nice thing about all of these, they're all MapReduce ready and they all can scale up quite nicely. Other things you may want to do is discovery we talked a little bit about. Basically the idea here is you want to group on scene content. You have all this massive amount of content and you want to bring all the things that are similar together. So again, if you're, if you're preparing these briefings, one of the things you might want to do is go through and cluster all of that content so that the idea being that you don't have to read all of those articles. If all of those articles are in this tightly bound group, I can maybe just read one or two of them and then know that the rest of those articles in that group are about that same kind of thing. That will save you a lot of time. And Mahout has a bunch of different ways for doing those. K-Means, Deer Chalet, Canopy, and there's a bunch of other ones. I think there's probably six or seven of those. So you can use that to do those and they're all MapReduce ready as well. Uh, you can do frequent pattern mining. The, uh, if you're familiar with the old, uh, it's kind of an urban legend these days, but the whole beer and diapers story. Do you guys know this one? Uh, the idea was that at Walmart back a long time ago, they, and it's, not, it's actually not even a true story, but it, it makes for a nice story anyways. The idea was that at Walmart, uh, they did all this analysis of their, their transactions, and they noticed that you know, young men in their 20s, whenever they bought, or a significant chunk of them, whenever they bought diapers, they also bought beer, right? And, and it's one of those associations that no one would think about if they hadn't actually seen the data to present them. So then the idea is, well, as a store, should we be putting the beer next to the diapers or should we keep it off separate? You know, I don't know. That's a decision for your business to make. But this frequent pattern mining kind of thing can help you do that. Uh, and actually, if you go to that uh, URL there, you'll see what Yahoo, Yahoo is actually using frequent pattern mining as a way of determining spam signals on Yahoo Mail. So that's all in production right now. And there's a really nice talk about how they use Hadoop and Mahout and Pig and all of these things to do that thing. Another common thing that you might want to do in search are things like, uh, most people recognize that adding phrases or phrase-like capabilities to their application make for better results because whenever users type in multiple words, often just finding those words together or near each other is often really what they want, even if they are doing or queries or and, you know, or if they just care about the words being somewhere together, actually having them nearer together can be better. So co-locations can actually help you Without having to do all the heavy work of a real phrase identification, you can do co-locations, which will find you statistically in, uh, interesting co-occurrences in large amounts of documents. All of these things are in Mahout. They're all MapReduced ready. You can go basically to our algorithms page, and you can find out more about those. On the Lucene and Solar side, these are things that are often, a lot of people are doing these days, especially in, in e-commerce and things like that. So faceting, how many people are doing faceting? Yeah, so you've got your counts down the side of, you know, according to your labels. That's all nice to have. Drill downs, filters, all those all parametric search. Those are all different ways people talk about it. Uh, Autocomplete or suggest. Basically, you know, and this is kind of a no-brainer, right? But a lot of people don't have autocomplete or auto-suggest on their site. And in fact, it's interesting because I was uh, talking with, well, I, I heard this secondhand from a friend of a friend, but uh, it was a very large internet retailer in the United States. And it's a great story, and it shows really the power of some simple intelligence in your application. They added auto-suggest to their website, and after they added auto-suggest, it added a billion dollars to their bottom line. One billion dollars, right? Think about that. Auto-suggest, that's almost trivial to add these days. I mean, it's in solar. Uh, Andre wrote the patch. It's going to be committed hopefully one of these days. Uh, but you can get auto and there's a number of other ways that you can do auto-suggest and uh, add that to your site and you can make one billion dollars as well. <laughs> spell checking is another one. Spell checking is tricky though. It's not enough just to add spell checking capabilities and give people suggestions about how they might otherwise spell theirs. You need to also factor in what users are often clicking on when they, so there has to be all these feedback loops in your spell checking to make sure that you're capturing when to give a suggestion and when not to give a suggestion because as it turns out, I think 
giving bad suggestions is probably worse than no suggestion as, all, as well. So that can be another area where you can factor in machine learning and some sort of intelligence to know when and where uh, to do that. Things like more like this and relevance feedback, the idea basically that you're, the user isn't very good at uh, qualifying their queries. So take and use the documents that they click on or, and, and expand your queries and do more searches. Uh, you can also do clustering and discovery tools in Solar right now using Carrot 2, for instance. Uh, that will do search result clustering and, and give you kind of what a lot of people call like dynamic faceting or on-the-fly faceting. It's not pre-configured what fields you're going to facet on. You let Carrot go and figure out what are the important labels in this thing, and then you can, you can get information about that. Some people are doing this. You see this in a lot of the social sites. But you, know, you could also expand this, of course, to internet sites, other kinds of sites, e-commerce. Basically, the idea is you know, share your user's joy, share their pain. How many people have actually looked at your user logs and, and could tell me if you're doing search or, or some of that, how many people know what your top queries are? Come on, guys. Not very many. Not very many. So, how can you build an effective application if you don't understand how, who your users are? We're all engineers, right? And users are those pesky people who pay the bills, right? They pay the bills. That's why you've got to understand what they do. If you want to take your career and your application and your company to the next level, you have to understand. And I would argue it's not enough just to hand this off and, oh, that's, that's what the business people worry about. That's what the business people worry about. I, I just care about working on these really hard problems. Well, I got news for you. The really hard problems are what the users are doing. That's why they come to you in the first place. And if you don't care about that kind of stuff, you're going to be off doing you know, stuff that's not interesting. So you know, what are some of the ways we can do that? Of course, there's all the social graph stuff. And, and there's a ton of graph algorithms out there. And you can find out about people's connectedness and all of that. And that's all great if you have information about that. If you're on a social network, then you know, of course you have it. But what about you know, places where you just got people clicking on your site and you're not sure? Or they're just off in the blogosphere or on Twitter and they're talking about you. So you can do things like sentiment analysis. You need to get into your log analysis. You need to understand what people are doing on your site. right? And, and then, of course, what happens is now you've got these feedback loops. You can cycle this back into your next release, and you can then make your, it's not like you have to solve this problem in your first release or overnight. But what you need to think about is, how can I put the infrastructure in place that helps me solve this problem as I grow and expand and scale and all of those good things? Another area, I think, you know, everybody's got, uh, I don't have my phone with me right now, but everybody these days, I think, has a GPS in their, their, in their phone or, or they have something that, you know, if you're doing uh, cell tower triangulation or things like that, we know where people are. I mean, Big Brother is here, right? We all know where each other, where each other is. And so we can start to think about, well, how can I use that location to give more intelligent things? You know, you see things, uh, sites like Foursquare and that who do this pretty effectively where you can, you know, you can, hey, my friends are over here and they just said, you know, this place is a great place to be. I should go check out that bar or I, I can meet up with them. You can do all of these things in Lucene and Solar and the, and the story's getting better here all the time. Being able to bring in location and filter your search results, filter, make an application that is location aware. Some of the things you might need, oh, of course, you've got to parse queries. You know, you've got to deal with addresses, especially uh, you know, in, in the United States and in Europe. Addresses are often very hard to deal with. You know, because uh, sometimes it's a street, sometimes it's a city, sometimes it's a state or a province or whatever. And users are notoriously bad at typing. So you need to have some intelligence in all of those things. Uh, and then what happens is what you want to do is very quickly reduce down that space so that you can just search within that space and, and without having to examine all of the documents. And then you want to do things like uh, factor in that distance, for instance. So all else being equal, I'd rather get coffee at a coffee shop nearer to me than one that's farther away. But maybe if I knew that that coffee that was a little farther away was better, had better user ratings, better, uh, better experience, better Wi-Fi, all of those things can then be factored into your search, your application scoring capabilities, and then I can then uh, make the choice about what I want to do. So those are just kind of getting started with locations and as all of those pieces. 
And then, of course, you've got all this data, right? I mean, and it's just, uh, just so much of it, and it's happening all the time. It never stops. It's like, the, you know, the post office used to say the mail never stops. Well, data never stops these days, right? You've got, you've got locations, you've got uh, logs, you've got all this stuff, and they're all happening, thousands and thousands of uh, transactions per second. And what you end up with at the end of the day with all of this stuff essentially is a really, really large matrix. You know, a matrix that spans, you know, hundreds or thousands of nodes and you've got petabytes of data and all that. It, it, it essentially at the end of the day all works out to be a big matrix. And of course, you then have this curse of dimensionality. You've got so many dimensions in that matrix that you need a way to reduce that down so that you can just get at what's the really the, the good signal in that data. What are the core pieces of that that I can work on? And so you want to start to think about feature reduction. And feature reduction is such a way that the things that I'm losing are things that are not as important as all the rest. And I would say that, and this is in my heart right now, one of the things that you can do here is called singular value decomposition. Uh, a long name, amazing results as the, as the commercial in the United States goes. Uh, what essentially feature reduction allows you to do is pick, a, pick the dimensionality that you want for that matrix and then it will go through and do all this fancy math and that you all forgot from the college days when you took your linear algebra class and it will come up with a much smaller matrix that then makes it easier for you to work with. So you can keep it in memory, for instance, and then if, as soon as you can keep it in memory, of course, then you can do a lot more with it. And of course, you still probably want to be, you know, it's still going to scale out across uh, a lot of nodes, but maybe instead of th needing a thousand nodes, you know, you only need a hundred nodes. And of course, your operations team will really love you because of that, right? Because you just save them a bunch of money. And then you save your, your company a bunch of money. And, and as it turns out, you can actually still get really good results from it because you're keeping all the things that are really valuable. And this is in uh, Mahout right now. And it is uh, scalable and it's in use at uh, several places. And in fact, if you go look up, I won't say their names, but if you go look up the guy who wrote, who wrote it, uh, his name is Jake Mannix. You can then figure out where he works and where it's being used. So that's a nice way of saying uh, me avoiding who actually is doing it. But one of the nice things for search maybe that you've seen or heard about is this notion of latent semantic analysis or latent semantic indexing or sometimes people call it conceptual search or semantic search kind of along those lines. Basically the idea that when users type in keywords what they're really interested in is the concept around those keywords, not necessarily those keywords. So if I type in the word uh, bank or banking, well, I, I'm also interested probably in things like financial institution or Wall Street or the stock exchange. The idea here behind this latent semantic analysis is using SVD to then pare down that matrix that I have to just those concepts and then I can do this essentially this conceptual search. And I'll leave it to the math whizzes here to figure out, you know, what's really going on underneath the hood. But there's an interesting new project here. It hasn't gotten a whole lot of traffic yet, I don't think, but uh, it's uh, on GitHub. And if you can go, if you go to search for LSA for solar, basically what it does is it takes Mahout and the singular value decomposition in Mahout and combines it with your solar index or your solar indexes. And then it can give this, uh, this LSA-based approach into your search space and that can help and that can be useful too. And of course with all these things take them with a grain of salt because you need to then test and validate that they work for you. So just because somebody, you know, some guy was standing up in front of you at buzzwords and says, oh SVD and LSA is this great thing, that doesn't necessarily mean of course that it's right for you. So take the time to actually figure out whether it works for you. So for instance, you could start, you could then take all of these things and if you're doing search, how many people are here doing search? Okay, so a good chunk of you. You can start to think about, well, you know, and this is just one view I have. I mean, it's not the only view and people do all kinds of things, right? But you can start to think about, well, what's a use case I could have for more enhanced search where it's not just, you know, a little text box up at the top, or maybe it is just a text box, and that's the nice thing because it really simplifies everything else, but then maybe I have more advanced visualizations, or I have just 
seamless intelligence on the back end, right? Like when you all go to Google and Yahoo and all of those, they're using machine learning and all of these things all the time. You just probably don't know it, but they're constantly mining their logs. They're constantly looking at all these interactions, the connections between all of you. They're tracking everything you do and, and where you spend your money, what you click on, all of those things. And they're using that to then, of course, deliver more targeted ads and better search results and all of those things. You can do that too. And I think you can do that right now using open source tools that you don't have to spend, you can spend more time integrating these kind of things instead of time actually building out these things. So for instance, you know, you can, you can get uh, latent semantic analysis. I believe uh, Julian's here from Gate. He does a lot of Gate work. They have some latent semantic analysis. Latent semantic, or uh, sorry, not uh, latent semantic analysis. I meant sentiment uh, analysis. You can get that in Gate. You can get that in several other tools. That's just a, basically a classification or organization problem of labeling your data. Uh, you can add in latent semantic analysis. You can add in co-locations and phrases. You can classify and cluster your content. So as you're indexing, you can automatically be labeling your data. Uh, we talked about it a little bit at the bar camp last night. So you can, as all that stuff's coming in, if you've trained a model, you can, and then just automatically apply labels in it. You can do things like uh, named entity recognition. Again, this is just a classification problem. Uh, finding all the people and places in your data and then making those available as facets so that people can then drill down on what they're looking for. All nice ways of visualizing these things. Uh, other things that, you know, are, uh, have some more intelligence in them, related searches, the frequent pattern mining stuff that I talked about, uh, you can use that to find related searches. So the idea here is go in and find all the associations. Whenever somebody types in, you know, the keyword bank, find all of the other searches that, that people did that also typed in the word bank. And then you can start to say things like, you see this on Amazon already. If you type in the word TVs, it'll give you suggestions. Well, people also search for LCD TVs or plasma TVs. You can build all those things in and, and they don't look like much from you know, a user standpoint, but they are really helpful. And if, if that results in five or 10% more conversion, I mean, think about what that can mean for your bottom line and, and your application and your career and all of those things because you're not all of a sudden the go-to expert on those things because you have the, the, the idea of always adding this intelligence and making it better. And we talked about some of these other things, clickstream analysis, constantly using uh, all of what people are clicking on to then feed back to re-rank your results. So in other words, if, if a document's always at the the 10th the, the document is always the one that people are clicking on when you ser somebody searches with that keyword. The idea is clickstream analysis can automatically boost that up. And you know, eventually over time it would become number one or number two because that's the most popular item. Of course, there's a downside that, to that too because as new data becomes available, there might be better results. And so you probably want to have some amount of jitter or randomness in there as well so that it doesn't just become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But all of those are part of the picture of adding intelligence to your application. Of course, there are other use cases. And uh, you know, if you want to talk more about it afterwards, I'd love to talk more about it. Uh, just kind of a couple of slides of where Mahout is going for those who are interested in Mahout. Do we actually have, how many people are using Mahout or have, have heard of it, tried it out, kicked the tires? Good. You know, I've, I ask this question every time and, and steadily the number of you is getting bigger and bigger and if I keep at it, I just got to keep giving more talks because then we'll have world domination, I think. <laughs> but actually, there's some, there's some really interesting things that are coming in Mahout. Uh, by the way, a Mahout is the person who takes care of an elephant, if you didn't know that, uh, with Hadoop having the elephant and all that. It's kind of a play on words. So, uh, On the recommender side, Couple of really interesting things here, the SVD based and the restricted Boltzmann machines. I'm not an expert in recommenders, but as I understand it, those are two of the major factors in what won the Netflix prize. So, you know, the million dollar Netflix prize that they all got in trouble for, for uh, giving away user data. But those are two of the things that went into building that. And those will be in Mahout hopefully by the end of the summer. We have two Google Summer of Code students uh, as well as a number of committers are working on those things. So you will be, in theory, be able to build what the Netflix prize winners built for free using Mahout. 
Obviously, there's probably more that still goes into it than that, but that's up to you to figure out. Uh, on the classifier side, filling in MapReduce neural networks. Uh, I think we've got plans for distributed support vector machines. Support vector machines is one of the very popular classifiers out there. You, if you've used like maybe LibSVM or some of those tools, you've used support vector machines, pretty high quality classifiers. That's going to be in Mahout. Uh, stochastic gradient descent, fancy word for saying logistic re regression. That's in the works right now and uh, holds a lot of promise as well. So these are all things that you can start to use to figure out how to classify We've got another Google Summer of Code who's doing this thing called Eigencuts, and I admit I don't understand it but, uh, fully yet, but uh, the idea here is yet another tool in the arsenal that you can use to help solve these kind of problems. Uh, other lower level kind of things that just, I think one of the goals in how we're on version 0.3 right now, uh, working towards one, getting things that make it easy for, easier for people to get their data in and out and consume Mahout, visualizations. One of the things that often goes with machine learning is, well, this big question, of, well, what should I use? Which algorithm is best for me? I think we need to do, do more on that end. If you like look at Weka, for instance, it has a whole lot of nice tools that allow you to run experiments and try out different approaches. I think we need those things at Mahal. And of course, the whole idea behind all of this is that you can do this at scale and really work to, uh, to make this viable in your application at very large volumes. So then I would say, you know, the takeaway here, and I think I'm about done, is you can right now build open, scalable, and intelligent applications, and you can focus on the end results or what your application needs to do. You don't have to build all of that scaffolding or all that infrastructure. You don't have to have a PhD in information retrieval or machine learning or any of those things. You can do all of this right now as part of your application on big data with commodity hardware and you can get good results and then you can take those results and continuously feed back on them such that over time you are getting better and better at this. And that really is all I have to say. So if we want, I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email or Twitter or uh, that's the book uh, I'm working on called Taming Text. Basically, the idea is using open source tools for doing things like natural language processing and machine learning. So feel free to contact me, any of those. Otherwise, any questions? No. Stun silence. All right. Well, just to reiterate then, thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the conference. I'll be here both days and love to talk to you about machine learning or intelligence or search or any of those good things. Thank you very much.